I'm going to tell you what this stuff is for in a moment, but not right now. <coughs> First, I, I need you to answer a question for me. What is this book about? Is that a question you have a, a pretty good answer to? That you feel you could get in a sentence? What is this book about? It's really big. It's got two halves. There's 66 books, a couple dozen authors. But this morning, I will share with you my contention that this book is really about one thing. Do you know what that is? Some of you have read this book cover to cover. In fact, uh, we'll try, that, try to do that together as a church again in 2024. Uh, read the entire Bible in a year. But are you able to tell me what the whole thing is about? Some people would say that this book is about God. Does that sound like a good answer? This is the book about God. It could be, but I'll have you know that there are a couple books in here that don't even mention his name. Did you know that's true? There, there are two books in the Bible that don't even say God's name. Anybody know what they are? Esther's one. Another one they didn't let kids read back in Israel. Song of Solomon, yeah. Doesn't say God's name. So I think that evidence, praise, that evidence weighs pretty heavily against the assertion that this book is about God. Parts of it don't even mention him. Maybe you're thinking this book is about Jesus. That is typically a good answer at church whenever a question is asked. And don't get me wrong, I like Jesus. And I will, I will admit that this answer is a shade of correct. But there are large portions of this book that not only don't mention Jesus, but don't get us really any closer to understanding him or even anticipating his arrival. What does Haggai have to do with Jesus? I mean, you can make the connection if you try really hard, but it's, it's, not, it's not on the surface for sure. But I'm done teasing this out. I will tell you the answer because it will be our subject for discussion here over the next several weeks. The Bible is the account of the people of God. That's what this book is about. Not even just about God itself or, or Jesus himself, but this book is, is about God's people. It is the account of God's people. And, and we work through some pretty heavy stuff in the beginning of the Bible. Uh, the first 11 chapters of the Bible cover millennia. And they tell us the things we need to know about, about God's creation, about who we are as people, about the problem of sin. And it describes in, in these incredible stories in the first 11 chapters of the Bible how sin corrupts and causes chaos and disorder and brokenness in the world. But that's only 11 chapters. In Genesis 12, a story begins that continues through every single page for the whole rest of the book. The story is about God calling a people unto himself through whom he can work to show his glory and goodness in the midst of our broken world. All of the Bible has to do with this story. When you read the history books in the Old Testament, they are about this people that God called unto himself. The books of poetry are, are written by them, written in the context of their covenant with God and their special relationship with him as, their, as his people. The prophets are, are all about what God's people, this group, should be doing and, and how it should be different than what they are doing. And, and then when you get to the New Testament, uh, you have Jesus coming within God's people and you have Jesus filling the role of God's people in a way that they were never able to do on their own. And, and, and then you have a new people of God with Jesus as their king arriving in the New Testament. And, and everything we read in the Bible is about the people of God. That's what this book is about. When we read the Bible, we learn what it means to be a part of the people of God. We learn what God wants from his people we get to see what happens when God's people rebel and fall short and make mistakes. We get to see what happens when God's people are faithful sometimes in the Bible. We even get to know the destiny of God's people unto eternity and resurrection. 
That is what this book is about. And it's, this is the primary mode of meaning and instruction when we read the Bible, is understanding how it relates to God's people. What we will do together as a church over the next several weeks here is to look broadly at how this relationship between God and his people works, and then we'll drop in to certain stories and passages to see who the people of God are, what he expects of them, and how they are to respond to God. This task cannot begin anywhere else but in Genesis 12. So if you want to open there with me this morning, that is where we'll be. Uh, but before I read from there, I want to conduct uh, an exercise for a game of sorts. And so I need a volunteer. That's what this equipment is up here for. I need Raina Maurer. Will you come up here? I was looking for volunteers this morning, and I found Raina. She said that she was very brave and not afraid of anything. So we're going to test Raina's skill here, uh, Brady and Bryce, if you guys want to come up, you guys are going to be my helpers. Now, Raina, had, I told Raina that she was going to be doing a trust fall this morning because we need to talk about trust, okay? When we talk about God's people in this story in Genesis 12 about Abraham, Abraham has to trust God, and uh, we're going to see how trusting Raina is of me, I guess, Okay? Me and Bryce and Brady here, okay? So, uh, Raina, for this to be a good trust fall, you need to, you need to wear a blindfold so you can't see. Because you can't trust if you can see, all right? So, I'm going to have you stand on this board here, okay? They're going to lift it up after a while, so you can just crouch down and, like, grab on right here. You see how that works? That way you're not, you know, shaking, okay? But here, stand up. Stand up. We're going to put on a blindfold, okay? Like this. And that, that is not... Efficient blindfold. We gotta. <laughs> you can peek through that one, but not this one. Uh, that would be fun. Okay, can you see anything? Oh, that is great. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so what? Uh, here, I got you. What? What Brady and Bryce are gonna do is they're gonna pick up this board and they're gonna put it up there on top of those ladders. Okay. And then. Uh, when, when I tell you to walk forward, all you, you don't have to jump or anything. You just take a step, just like you're stepping forward, and then we are going to catch you because you trust us. And we're going to take care of you. We're going to make sure you don't fall. Okay? So here, what I need now is, so Brady and Bryce, I need you guys to, uh, to pick up the board here with Raina. Raina, you want to crouch down and grab onto the sides of that board like I showed you there? That way, yeah, there you go. Here we go. Yes, perfect. Now, if you guys just want to walk her up there to the top of the ladder, that would be great. You know, make sure she doesn't tilt off back or forth one way or the other. And, uh, yeah, if you guys can just, you know, there you go, up on the ladder now. Up higher, that higher. Yeah, you got to get way up on the top there. Yep, up higher. That's good. Now up to the very top. Now, okay, great. Now you just set her down there. Okay, Reina, you're at the top of the ladder now. Okay, you can stand up. It should be pretty solid if you just want to stand straight up. Good. All right, now you're pretty high up in the air. In fact, in fact, if you just reach down, you could probably feel the top of my head. Can you feel the top of my head? <laughs> That's good, okay, because you're very high up in the air. Okay, about as high as I am. Okay, all right. Now stand up. Stand up. Okay, stand up. Okay, I, well, I can't, I can't reach you. So, no, I can't. So, just stand up straight here. Okay, good. Okay. Now, we're going to catch you, I promise. Okay, but I just need you to take a step forward, and then we're going to catch you, all right? So, go ahead and step, step forward off these ladders. Okay? Okay, go ahead and step forward <laughs> off the ladders. Just go ahead and take a step right off the ladders and we're gonna catch you okay just a big step so you can get clear of the ladders here so nice big step Raina go ahead and you can do it you can do it oh no don't fall just take a big step and we'll catch you ready go <laughs> you weren't at the top of the ladders but you did great. Thank you so much for being my volunteer. Thank you. Everybody give Raina a round of applause. That's good. Uh, 
thank you for trusting me, Reyna. <laughs> I did tell your dad beforehand that I promised to not hurt you and that we weren't going to put you on top of those ladders. <laughs> I was thinking about what, was, what we were going to do here this morning. I just found myself thankful that Derek's dad, our insurance agent, wasn't here. <laughs> he may have stopped me. Um, in Genesis 12, if you guys are open there, if you didn't close your Bible out of fear for Raina's life, then what we find there is, is a story uh, about the beginning of the people of God. And uh, we, uh, we're introduced, actually, I told you Genesis 12, I lied. We're going to start at the very end of Genesis 11. If you go up from there just a little bit. Uh, there we're being told about a man named Terah. And uh, Terah is the father of Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. And uh, we read this about Terah's family. In Genesis 11:31. it says, Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of his son Abram, and together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Terah lived 205 years, and he died in Haran. Okay, so this family was going to go to Canaan. They started out from Ur of the Chaldeans, but they didn't make it there. They stopped and settled in Haran. And uh, you know what's coming next because my name is Joel. We're going to look at a map, okay? And uh, for a long time, we thought Ur of the Chaldeans was down here, uh, the famous ancient city of Ur in Sumer uh, down in modern-day Iraq, okay? Uh, but... Uh, it is more likely, uh, we think now, uh, because of discovering instances in ancient literature where they talk about a town up here in Aram uh, that is also called Ur, that this is probably where Abraham's family was from and where they were living. This makes a little more sense because Haran isn't exactly on the way to Canaan for uh, Terah and his family and because when, uh, when uh, the servant is sent back to find a wife, for Isaac from his father's family, he goes to Padan Aram, and he goes up there. So, uh, Terah did not make it very far on his journey to Canaan, did he? He is still living among his people and around the place where he grew up. Uh, but God is going to come to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 and give him a different instruction. As we begin reading in chapter 12, we're going to be reading the very beginning of the story of God's people that will fill the whole rest of the entire Bible. So I want you to pay close attention to how this story begins. How does the story uh, that will fill the entire Bible between God and his people, in which way does it start? In chapter 12, verse 1, it says, The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. This is a big demand. This is something that would be very difficult for Abraham to do. He has to leave uh, this place where he was in Haran, this place uh, just very close to where his father grew up in Ur, and, and he has to go somewhere else, somewhere he's never been. He has to travel there in the ancient world at a time where coming back home or, or only staying for a little while was not practical. It couldn't, couldn't be done. For Abraham to leave his family this time would mean his disinheritance. He'd be leaving his family's possessions, his family's land. In fact, we see uh, when uh, Jacob is, uh, goes back to find a wife from his, uh, from his uh, grandfather's family uh, that... that Abraham's family uh, is, is wealthy, and they have many possessions. Abraham left that. And so I want you now to look closely at the very beginning of God's interaction with his people, and how does it all start? It starts with a challenging, clear, and direct command. This is the most basic or foundational dynamic for the interaction between God and his people. God wants his people to do something. God wants from his people, not just for them to remain the same and for God to pick them and, and they, 
they just belong to him. And, but no, that's not how this relationship works. This story is about God wanting some people who he's going to select to do something. Now, he wants something very specific from Abraham. He wants Abraham to get up and leave. Uh, go to Canaan. But God is not done speaking. Uh, God does not just tell Abraham to do what he says, although he could do that. He is God. He has that position of authority. But as we read on in verse 2, we find these words. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. God's command is coupled with a promise. This is how the story of God's people begins, is with a command, hey, do what I say, and then a promise. If you do it, I'm going to take care of you. I will bless you. Essentially, he's telling Abraham, you're not going to regret it. Obey me and I will bless you. This mode of interaction continues on repeat through all of Scripture. It is, a, it is a way that we interact with, now, with God now, at this moment. I want you to see that at the beginning of the story of God's people, God demands a lot from Abraham. God comes to him with a big command, one that was very demanding upon his life and one that, that Abraham would have to fully commit to. God's demands are big. They're big for Abraham. They're big for me and you, too. But so are his promises. God asks a lot of Abraham, and God promises a lot to Abraham. So what will Abraham do? He's been giving, uh, given a challenging command, one his father didn't get done, though he intended to. He's been given a challenging command and a big promise. What will Abraham do? As we read on in verse 4, we get this. So Abraham went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. In obeying God's command, not only did Abraham become the physical, uh, biological father of God's people, but Abraham becomes the model for what it would look like for all of God's people going forward, for what it would take. The people of God must trust him when he tells them what to do. This is the most basic foundation of what it means to belong to God's people is that God is going to tell us what to do and we have to trust him so that we will do it and trust the promises that he has given us when we are obedient to him. And this morning I need you to know that if you wish to belong to God's people, that you must put your trust in him. And I want to be crystal clear about what I mean when I say that. Because oftentimes when we talk about trusting God, we're not talking about obedience, are we? We're talking about provision. When somebody, you might hear somebody say, I trust God, what they mean is that no matter what they encounter in life, they trust that God is going to take care of them. But that's not the kind of trust that Abraham exhibits here. That's not the kind of trust that starts the story of the people of God in Scripture. Abraham wasn't called to do whatever he wants and then hope that God catches him if something goes wrong. That's not trust. That's not the trust that we see here in this passage. Trust here for Abraham means that when I do what God says, he will care for me. And when I invite you to trust God so that you can belong to his people, I'm not saying that, that, you, should, uh, that you should hope that he will take care of you when things go bad or when you encounter a tough situation. What I'm asking you to do is to be willing to obey him and rely on his provision. 
because what he's asking you to do is going to be hard. And what he's asking you to do is not going to come naturally. It's not going to be what the rest of the world is doing. The rest of the world wasn't moving to Canaan with Abraham. The rest of Abraham's family wasn't moving to Canaan with Abraham. God told him, I need you to do something difficult, something challenging. And if you trust me, you won't regret it. I will make you a blessing. I, I will give you, uh, I will make your, your family great. I will make you a blessing to all peoples. <clears throat> to belong to God's people, we have to do as Abraham did. We have to trust him enough to obey the challenging things that he tells us to do. That's what it, that's what the basic foundational model, that's what it means to belong to God's people is that we are the ones who are willing to tell God, yes, I will do what you have said and I will rely on the promises that you have given me in accordance with my obedience. In last week's Bible reading that we did together as a church, we read the second half of Hebrews and in there, we have a passage here about Abraham and about, about what he does here in Genesis chapter 12. In Hebrews 11 verse 8, it says this, By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went. Even though he did not know where he was going, by faith he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents as did Isaac and Jacob who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. This is what makes Abraham special, is that he trusted God enough to obey him. And so it says when God told him to go to Canaan, he obeyed and went. If you want to be a part of God's people, you have to trust God enough to obey him. And a lot of the things that we read God, that God wants us to do in his word, can feel pretty difficult, can't they? A lot of what it takes to be a Christ follower in 2022 isn't very easy. It doesn't seem very convenient or very cool. But if you want to belong to God's people, you have to trust him enough to say, okay, I will do this challenging thing that you've asked of me, and I'm going to trust you to not let me down. I'm going to trust you to not let me regret it when I do. Do you trust God enough to obey what his word says? Do you trust God enough to obey what God's, God's word says about drunkenness? Do you trust God enough to obey what his word says about relationships? About purity, about marriage? Do you trust what God says enough to forgive people who wrong you? Be they your spouse or your sibling or a coworker? Or someone who has, done, who has done something to you that, that hurt your family, do you trust God enough to obey what he says about forgiveness and mercy? Do you trust God enough to love your enemies? To pray for the people who are unkind to you? Do you trust God enough to obey what his word says about obeying the governing authorities, and praying for our leaders. Do you trust God enough to proclaim the truth of his word as we're instructed to do in a world that won't accept it and won't treat you kindly for believing it? That's what trust means. And if you want to belong to the people of God, you have to trust enough that you will obey like Abraham did. Abraham obeyed and went in Hebrews 11 by faith. 
That is how the people of God begins, and that is how you can be a part of the people of God. You have to trust God enough to obey him. And if you do, he promises to not, to not let you down, to not let you regret that. Will you examine where in your life you're hesitant to obey God? Will you consider what you've been holding back, that the thing you haven't been trusting him about, knowing the, the area where you know what he wants you to do, but, but you've been unwilling to let it go because it's inconvenient, because it's not what you want, because it's not how everybody else lives? Will you hear God's call to Abraham and know that it's the same to you? Obey me, and I won't let you down. Let's pray. To God, thank you for being so good that we can trust you. Dear God, when we look at our lives and we, we examine uh, just our, the relationships we have and, and the responsibilities and, and what we enjoy, God, it, it often doesn't seem like obeying you is what we want. But dear God, we know that you see what we can't. We know that, that we're like Raina standing on a board with a blindfold. Dear God, give us the trust that it will take to obey your word so that we can receive the blessings of your promises, so that we can be counted among your people. To God, give us a spirit that is strong and willing to obey you when it's hard, when it's inconvenient, when it's not what we want. Because we know that your promises are true and you will not let us down. Pray these things in your name. Amen.